All right, this evening, our speaker is going to be Richard Allen, and he's going to talk to us about sustainable, sustainable Cambodia. Now, Richard is an engineer. He's also an entrepreneur from Gainesville, Florida. He's co-founded eight companies in a variety of technologies, including electronics, medical devices, uh, biologistics, and GPS systems. Richard and his wife, Susan, join friends and fellow Rotarians in co-founding Sustainable Cambodia. This organization works with families in rural Cambodian villages to help them achieve sustainability and self-sufficiency through clean water, agriculture, income generation, and schools. Richard has received the Service Above Self Award from Rotary International for his work in Cambodia. This young man, <clears throat> I found out today, went to school and his first degree was creative writing. He's a writer. Uh, I'm gonna to have to prod him and push him a little bit so he can go out and write a book. He says he wrote one a long, long time ago. We need a new one up on Cambodia and all of his adventures. So maybe that's something him, him and his wife can work on in the future. Without any other further ado, I'm going to go ahead and step out of the screen and the limelight and I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Richard Allen. Richard, if you'll give us somewhere around 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll have questions and answers. Very good. I'm um, going to see if I can get the... We can see, we can see your slide. Yes, we can see your slide and we can hear you. Uh, there it is, great. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so thanks very much for, for the, this opportunity to be here and may I don't know even I don't know how you found out about us but uh, we, we can connect afterwards and, and figure that out uh, as may said she was there in 2020 uh, and she was on one of our rotary rotary trips um, and I'll, I'll tell you about those as well um, so what we have with sustainable Cambodia it's a rotarian led empowerment project uh, which is all about empowerment and sustainability in these rural uh, villages in Cambodia um, we try to address community needs that, uh, and, and we have measurable outcomes, as you can see from this slide. Uh, we started this, gosh, uh, around 20 years ago. I'll give you the background on that. Uh, it's been a long-standing project. As you can imagine, we've learned a lot over that time. The area of Cambodia in which we really focus is around, if you can kind of see in the middle of the slide there, uh, in the middle of Cambodia, there's a large lake called the Tonle Sap. So we work around that lake and primarily to the south of it in a number in several provinces there and in those rural villages and of course everyone knows Cambodia is kind of located in between if you will Vietnam and Thailand it has a little bit of uh, ocean uh, ocean access but not as much as Thailand or Vietnam have the, um, uh, the over over this past 20 years the project has grown we now have we've had over the life of the project about a hundred we're a little bit more than hundred clubs that have been involved. We have about 30 clubs that are super active clubs that are doing something with us all the time. Um, and as you can see from this slide, they range from Florida, uh, across all across Australia from Western Australia to, uh, to the East of the country, um, across uh, mostly Western Canada and Calgary and Vancouver. Uh, and other states in the United States, of course, New York, uh, lots of clubs in New York, lots of clubs in the South Lake, in the Salt, in the uh, Utah area around South uh, Salt Lake City, uh, but also Budapest, Budapest in, involved with us in Hungary, uh, some clubs in, in the UK. Um, so we've just had a lot of support from a lot of clubs. We're probably one of the larger uh, international projects that uh, Rotary clubs around the world participate in. So how did we get to there? <laughs> how did it all begin? Um, the, uh, so in 2000, uh, a friend of ours was just a neighbor in our, in our neighborhood in Gainesville, Florida, uh, Bruce Lasky, human rights attorney, uh, who is now with the Chiang Mai Rotary Club in Thailand, uh, took a year off from his legal work and decided to travel around the world. And as part of traveling around the world, one of the countries he landed in was, was Cambodia. Uh, he had the opportunity to get out into the rural villages. And uh, as, as um, you had noted at, at the beginning of this, uh, what he found out there in the real rural areas was people living 
as he described it, like in the Stone Age. I mean, they had no fresh water, they had no irrigation, they had only subsistence rice, and they weren't even very good at growing rice for reasons I'll, I'll get to. No sanitation, uh, education just incredibly limited, um, just uh, terrible circumstances. Bruce wanted to do something about it, um, kind of rotary heart. And um, uh, the, 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 besides the Khmer Rouge experience, Cambodia does have these long dry seasons. They have four to five months of the year during which there's basically no rain. Um, so that complicates things for them. But after the Khmer Rouge, um, the, the families wound up being moved to different parts of the country where they didn't e even have roots. Uh, they didn't actually know how to grow rice very well. Uh, there were almost no educated adults. If everybody's familiar with the Khmer Rouge experience, uh, part of that genocide was directed towards anybody that had an education, anybody that spoke a foreign language, anybody that had uh, any uh, interaction with the Western world, anybody that uh, spoke, uh, any, anybody that uh, you know had any professional background or education. Uh, Put to death or put into internment camps, and uh, so there were, you know, it's just a terrible, terrible situation afterwards. The, uh, the the parents, of course, needed the children to be able to carry water, to be able to work in the fields. Uh, the areas that the kids would go to get the water far from the villages. Uh, sometimes they'd have to spend an hour or two carrying water, like this young man's doing on their shoulders, and, and doing field work rather than getting to uh, to school. Also dysentery health problems, really major. Every family would suffer from dysentery on a bi-weekly or tri-weekly basis. Um, malnutrition in the kids, uh, especially, and, and children raising their siblings. Um, so just a really, really tough situation. And that's what Bruce found when he arrived, as many people did when they got out in the rural villages and, and really met this, this situation. Um, so Bruce reached out to uh, family friends and to Rotarians and to uh, uh, just people that, that he was in communication with by email at the time and basically said, uh, you know, can anybody help me get a little school started? Uh, I found a family over here that would like to start a school and I'd like to support them. And in fact, his mother was the first one that responded. His mother was Sylvia Lasky. And she basically said, Bruce, I'll give you $150 to to help with the project, but you've got to promise me that every penny of that's going to go to the kids and 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 uh, and nothing else. And so that became actually a founding principle of Sustainable Cambodia that every penny goes into the, the kids uh, and the program. Um, and and Bruce did help the family get that that school started, but you know it it turned out just not to be a sustainable project uh, because you know the families needed. The kids to be able to work in the schools, uh, or work in the in the in the fields, and to carry the water and to do all that stuff, and you know, and the kids were still sick. So he was basically helping the the families to keep their kids in school by buying them rice every month. If they kept their kids in school, they got a certain amount of rice. So when we got involved in about 2001, 2002 with Bruce in this, we said, you know, we all agreed we needed to have a sustainable. Uh, development model. And we studied uh, organizations around the world like Heifer International uh, and the like and came up with what we thought would be a, a really good sustainable development model. Um, and it, it's all focused on family empowerment. And uh, that was really the effective beginning of sustainable Cambodia when we became more than just a little tiny school, but we then grew into what I'm going to tell you about with sustainable Cambodia. We, uh, our, our focus is all on empowerment. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, we have no paid staff uh, of any sort other than native Cambodians working in Cambodia. Uh, we uh, work entirely, entirely with the village families in an empowerment model so that they do the project work themselves. Um, and they, they do all the planning and they do all the work. The, uh, uh, and, and together we're basically trying to help rebuild the country from the inside out. Um, the way that our Rotary Club first got involved was uh, in 2004, we took our first real expanded Rotary trip and several Rotarians from our Gainesville, Florida club uh, went over with us. 
and uh, and as part of that, we we really got. I think we did our first 3H grant. That was a pr- uh, predecessor to the global grants. Um, and at the same time, we got a chance to introduce to some of the local uh, leadership there Rotary itself, the whole concept of Rotary. And as we were explaining, and this is a, one of our Rotarians from our club, Tim Sorrell, as he was explaining this to this gathered group of, of leaders from, uh, from Cambodia, uh, the, the concept of service above self just resonated with them. And they, they, you could just see the light go off in their eyes. And so within about 18 months of that time, they had started the first Rotary Club in rural Cambodia. Um, and that club has existed since 2006 now, and it's a very vital club. They've had anywhere from 20 to 30 members at, at any given time. Uh, from there, we have grown over the years to have all these other clubs that I mentioned around the world that are involved in this. Um, I believe this is uh, when, when some of the New York Rotary Rotarians were on one of their visits, and these are all biosand filters that you see lined up in front of them. Uh, so these uh, Rotary clubs around the world have been really, really integral in this, and especially the New York area clubs and the Utah area clubs and Australian clubs. As I said, we, we're, uh, we're over 100 clubs um, as partners. And uh, the, the business model or the, the development model that we have wound up um, uh, evolving into, and we've, we've probably been now 12 years since we fully evolved into this model, and we've just moved from village to village to village with it. And it, and it has proven to be really, really workable. And it's got these two legs to it, if you will, community development and education. On the community development side, it's all it all starts with empowerment, uh, <clears throat> village development committees and self-help groups in each village that self-organize, and then they decide which of these projects they're going to implement, implement and how they're going to do them. But those are primarily around safe water, agriculture for income generation, um, and sanitation and hygiene. And then on the education side, we have uh, uh, each of the villages. Uh, generally creates a preschool and a community school so that the kids can get early education uh, and and early intellectual stimulation and creativity stimulation in their villages. And then they have the opportunity to go to the large feeder schools that we have. And from those enrichment feeder schools, then they have the opportunity to get university scholarships in Cambodia from Sustainable Cambodia. And uh, uh, over time, we've had just tremendous success with this model. It allows the village families to uh, uh, to create an environment in which the kids aren't required to work and carry water and everybody is healthy enough that they can keep their kids in school and they definitely want to keep their kids in school and they, and they have access to the education. So after, after 20 years of this, it, it really has been an effective model. It all starts with these village development committees and this is kind of a representative of what a village development committee meeting looks like. <laughs> um, the, at the village development committees, various families will de- uh, move off into what's called self-help groups. Those are uh, five to seven families in each self-help group. And they choose the projects that they're going to be involved with. Um, and, and usually it's gonna involve wells, installation of wells. So this is uh, just a representative one of the wells. Biosand filters, these biosand filters are incredibly effective. Each family generally gets a biosand filter uh, and it's all built on site and it's made out of concrete and it has these little stri- uh, these little areas of styration during which water is able to go through biological layers and winds up being completely potable when it comes out, completely drinkable and safe. Uh, the latrines are a huge part of this project. Uh, the way the project works is that the bottom part of the latrine is is provided by Sustainable Cambodia with a small um, uh, copay from the from the families, and then the whole top part that you see that's visible above the ground is all th- built by the families themselves. So it depends on how well the family is doing as to whether it's made out of metal or whether it's made out of thatch, but um, but it's incredibly important because otherwise you're just basically going out in the rice fields. Uh, for latrines. Um, we also at the uh, preschools and community schools, we have these uh, rooftop rainwater harvesting tanks, these large globes, they hold 4,000 liters of, of water from the uh, from the rainy season. 
And then the little outbuilding that you see here is a school latrine. So the school latrines are a little bit larger, a little bit nicer, so they, they will take care of all the children at the schools. We have an animal pass-on program for agriculture, which really helps the families in those self-help groups. What they do is they organize to where, and usually the most useful animals are either cows or buffalo that are used for plowing the fields. And those will be shared among five to seven family members. And if there is progeny that comes from those, then they pass those on to another self-help group. Um, and, and then they can do the same thing with chickens and pigs and, and, and ducks. Uh, so that's based on Pepper International. Uh, one of the things we really like about that program is that it empowers the, the families themselves as donor families. So they get to actually not just do something for themselves, but they do something then to give to another village. And that really gets to the heart of how this whole development project works, that each village, when it, it takes about three to five years for a village to work through becoming sustainable, at the end of five to six years, you're, you're just doing some careful monitoring with them and being sure that if there are any problems that arose that nobody expected, that, you know, that, that they're able to address them. Uh, and during that period of maybe six to seven years, they become a graduate village. And then as a graduate village, members of the village development kid committee and some of the self-help groups will actually move and, and uh, they'll actually help one of the surrounding villages that are going to then join the program and start from scratch. They go in and they explain to those, those village families as part of the process, how this works and uh, all the challenges and how to overcome those challenges. So again, it's real empowerment model in the sense that they are doing community service themselves as they move from village to village. The uh, agriculture part of the program is uh, a, a really central part of it because families have to have enough income to be able to keep their kids in school. Um, and so we help them with seed stock and, and uh, education on how to grow alternative crops, uh, a number of different types of crops that they can take to the, to the market and sell. And they actually generate really good income as well as having a very, a very sustainable food supply themselves. So, so that back on the top part of the screen, that's the community development side of this that, I, that I've just walked through. The long-term, really long-term vision on this is to have tens of thousands of children who go through the education process, come out of the other end of this education process with a rotary heart, community service, with uh, knowing that they can actually get out and do something to help not only themselves, but to help their, their, their village and to help their, their community and their country. Uh, and the way we accomplish that is through the education side down at the bottom. So I'm just gonna walk through a little bit of that. Like I described, we have uh, many of the villages create a preschool and then a small community school uh, if they can't, if they, especially if the kids can't just immediately walk to one of our supplemental feeder schools. Um, and in these schools, uh, at the preschools, we have a hot, a hot lunch or a hot breakfast. Uh, it's a protein rich breakfast that's done by the village, uh, uh, somebody from the village uh, or, or a series of mothers in the village uh, produce the, the, the uh, meal for the kids in the morning. It's a big draw for the kids. Uh, from these preschools uh, that, that they feed into the community schools, which are more like grades, you know, one through probably one through seven, that kind of thing. The kids then have an opportunity to really learn in ways that they wouldn't be able to learn. And for those who were here at the very beginning, before we started the program, my, my, my wife Susan was explaining some of the opportunities for creativity to be part of this, for art to be part of this. Um, there's just a lot of learning opportunities. The kids wind up studying about health and nutrition, how all of that works in the body, how the, how the bodies work, food and sanitation training, uh, you know, germ theory and all of that. Uh, the, we, we try to have little school libraries in each of those uh, areas and these provide, and, and the librarians are a big part of our program for us. Uh, so that becomes uh, part of the learning for the kids. Um, <clears throat> this happens to be one of the community uh, community schools. The artwork that you see on the walls here is all done by uh, volunteers from an organization that our Rotarians in Utah organized on summer trips every 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 year. Uh, so those schools all lead to our enrichment schools, and these enrichment schools are running 
uh, side by side with state schools. So we're not taking the kids out of state school. We're actually requiring them to be in state school. And then for two or three hours a day, they get these enrichment programs at our enrichment schools. And uh, that's where they really get to have a lot of interaction with, with computers. They get to um, learn about the world. Uh, we have dormitories for the girls that live too far from the villages to be able to go to school. So they'll spend the weekend at home and uh, stay in the dormitory during the week. Um, each of the, and this is a super important part of the education program, is that each of the enrichment schools has a youth club. And the youth club is based on Rotary. So it's, in essence, it's like an Interact or a Rotary, a uh, Rotaract, but we didn't want to necessarily call it Interact because we wanted Rotary to be a big part of the name. So the youth clubs uh, all practice the four-way test and they all do the rotating leadership that Rotary does. And they are all focused on community uh, service projects and school service projects, and they are just the brightest, most wonderful uh, kids that you'll that you would ever want to meet. Uh, from those, usually the kids that are really active in the youth club and, and a number of the others, they have an opportunity to then go on to Cambodian University on a scholarship. Um, has to you know, and those scholarships from us are in Cambodian universities. We've had three hundred and fifty plus. Uh, 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 that have already gone into the Cam uh, Cambodian University program. Uh, this is one of our gatherings in Phnom Penh with uh, some of the uh, SC uh, university students. So back to this entire concept of having a truly sustainable change. It's, it's all empowerment based. It's based on having the families have the health, the income that they need, the education elements that they need, and the community service rotary heart uh, that you, you have to have in order for you to have truly sustainable change at, uh, at a large cultural level. Uh, so I'm just gonna walk through a few slides really quickly here and keep an eye on the time. Um, we've got, uh, this gives you an idea of how many, what we've done with a lot of these projects today. It's 230 plus wells, 16,000 people. Uh, all these rooftop rainwater harvesting tanks, some 7,000 individuals that, that uh, benefit from those. Uh, the biosand filters, each family, like I said, basically has a biosand filter. Of uh, the many villages that were in, uh, 2,500 of those. Uh, the latrines are slowly catching up with that. Um, uh, I think eventually we will have almost every family having a latrine. Uh, these large community ponds, I left these out, out of the original introduction, but this is actually a big part of the program as well. Um, they provide water catchment for that four months or so of really dry season, and it allows them to produce fish, uh, keep fish stock in these community ponds, and to use some of that for irrigation for the agriculture projects. The, uh, uh, this is a, these are a few shots from some of the uh, graduate villages, the ones that have completely, you know, gone through the program and are now helping other villages around them. They're really kind of idyllic. Uh, they're, they're beautiful places. They can grow great food. They've got great um, farm animals, and it's a really nice place to live. Uh, we've had 5,500 children that have been through um, the program to date. Uh, so quickly, just walk through our funding on this and how we've made this happen over the years. Uh, and this again has just kind of evolved. Uh, we're, we have a child sponsorship program. Um, uh, May is a, as a, as an example, is a child sponsor. Um, the, uh, so about a third of our funding probably comes from the child sponsorship programs. Uh, some 25% or so comes from our board members, my wife and I and founders and supporters. Uh, and then we have all these club and district grants over the years. You know, some clubs just get involved like the Poiku Beach Hawaii Club, uh, you know, is they just do different projects constantly and, and a number of other clubs do. And then we've had a number of uh, global grants. You can see actually our first one was a 3H grant, but I think we've had one, two, three, four, five. We've had at least five global grants, including one that's, uh, that's just starting up right now and one that's about a year and a half into the grant. So, uh, so really kind of balanced funding and it's been really helpful for us to have that. These, uh, when we do a, a global grant, 
you know, what you see here is kind of what I've already described. This is everything that they encompass. They encompass the entire sustainable development model that we've, that we've created over time. Um, oh, quickly, I, I just wanted to update because everybody wants to know how, how things going with COVID over there. Uh, the, the, the country had had a couple of waves of COVID early on that uh, they, they were able to lock down really quickly and, and control. They're currently in one that's, uh, that isn't completely out of control, but it certainly is a third wave that's much, much larger than the others. Uh, all of the schools in the country and all, all the public places in the country are basically on lockdown right now. Um, and they are in the process of trying to, uh, to get their, their, their hands around this. And we hope they will. It's of course difficult to get enough vaccine into countries like this. So they're, they're having to use mostly the conventional methods um, we do have a, a sewing program, uh, which was actually started by one of our one of our youngsters that, that started out in the schools and now runs the sewing program. And they have done some, I think, upwards of ten thousand masks that have been uh, put put out into the into the public there uh, in, in all the uh, provinces in which we work. So we've been active with that. Um, I think in a minute here. Actually, before I get to that, I'm just going to, I might have a slide on this, but I just want to mention also part of what has been something we never really anticipated or expected in the sustainable model is that of our staff currently, uh, more than 50% of our staff are students who started as youngsters in those rural schools and then grew up, graduated grade 12 through our enrichment program. They were probably part of youth club. Uh, they went on to university scholarship through our scholarship programs and they have now returned and they're part of the program. And so it's just kind of amazing that now we have these beautiful young people who have are now young adults um, and are back and are leading the, leading the program. Um, so I think the remainder of my slides are just kind of a quick overview, and then I'll I'll have some time here for some questions. I think at the end, we're uh, so health and sanitation, of course, big part of what we do uh, in the schools. These you know the opportunity to expand the horizons through the internet and having their having world community connectivity. Uh, they get to explore. We brought over micro, uh, microscopes, and kids got to explore with microscopes. Uh, uh, a real emphasis on girls in our program. Um, we have uh, more than 50% of all the students in the program are, are female. And uh, this is all the children that you see in this little list here are, or in this photo here, we're all sponsored by a physician in the United States who herself is Cambodian, who had come to the U US early on and she wanted to sponsor a lot of kids and so you can see these are all the girls that she sponsored it's just a lovely photo um, the youth clubs i just can't tell you what an important aspect of all this is uh, the youth clubs are like rotary clubs with all the enthusiasm that you see here from these youngsters and uh and if you get a chance to go over and visit with us you will see firsthand how powerful their rotary hearts are um, the uh, 16 generations now of university scholars are uh, <clears throat> among our, our very first uh, scholarship uh, graduates uh, are, are two of our central leaders now in the organization, including the young woman that's at the top left of this photo. Um, uh, we have a lot of volunteers that come on site. Um, and Joan, similar to what you did, in our case, most of our volunteers come and spend at least three months, and it's anywhere from uh, maybe two months at the shortest to six months as a typical longest. So they really get immersed. We've got places for them to stay, and they, they really get involved in the program at a, at a very integral level. And we have about 400 of those volunteers over the last 16 years. Um, this is the slide I was talking about. I wanted to be sure that more than half of our team today are former SC students. So uh, in these wrap-up slides, um, this is, again, it's about empowerment. Um, it's about families being empowered. Uh, it's about young people being empowered. 
And it's about Rotary, Rotarians being empowered and inspired. Uh, we have these Rotary trips that we make. This is one of our Rotary visits. Uh, when, uh, when we get off the first bus and everybody goes inside and you, you, you meet the students for the first time. And it's, it's, it's an amazing experience to, to do that. Uh, it, it's one of the most, uh, when I go to Rotary International Conventions, I'm always just blown away in the House of Friendship by how much Rotary does around the world, how much Rotarians do around the world. And, uh, and this is that in a, a microcosm. It's Rotarians in action. Uh, all these Rotarians from around the world that get involved in this um, and, and are a part of it. So uh, just in wrapping up, a couple of slides here saying thank you <laughs> from everybody involved. And uh, I'll just mention that we do these Rotarian-led journeys to Cambodia. Uh, we do them, we had been doing them at least twice a year. And of course with COVID, uh, we, I think the one that, um, uh, I, I think that one in, February of 2020 was our, our probably our last last one that we got to do. Uh, we are planning another one probably for the end of 2022. We would go earlier in 2022, except it gets pretty hot in the summers. Um, there will be one in the summer, but it'll be mostly the young people, high school age uh, and university age that will be going. Uh, so we'll probably be somewhere in November or December of 2022. But everybody is welcome to come join us on one of these trips. And with that. I just want to thank everybody for this opportunity to tell you the story about sustainable Cambodia. And uh, here's a, our, our board of directors is made up of, uh, is led by a number of Rotarians from different clubs. And these are some of the Rotarians on our, on our board. And all of them are very active. If you know any of these people, please reach out to them. And uh, of course, US office at sustainablecambodia.org is our email address be happy to communicate with anybody about about the project. So with that, I think I'll open it up for questions and if anybody has any. You close the screen share, please. There you go. All right. Uh, close it. Yeah, please close that. Got it. All right. There you go. Now we're now we're back to live again with everybody. All right, great. We've got 23 people on. I didn't see how many were on during your presentation, but this is very typical, Richard, of what we get from around the world. You have a couple of places in the United States, Canada, um, Germany, and other countries. And these people are interested in hearing what you had to say. Super program. For everybody on the screen, I think let's give us, let's give Richard a round of applause, please, everybody. Thank you very, very much, Richard. I appreciate the word you had to say. Now, I see a couple people with their hands up, so I'm going to get on these people first. You have to understand, uh, Mike and Tom, you have to understand that uh, you're not one of our regular club members. So, unfortunately, I've got a priority, and I, I give the first question to one of our club members, our own club members first, and you guys will be second and third as soon as, as, soon as we have a member ask a question. Brando, would you like to ask that question, or do you want to turn it over to Rami? Well, you know, Michael, I would like to ask the question, and it's, it's sort of a multi-part question because it's still forming in my mind. Number one, I, uh, from what I saw, as the children progress through the different levels of education, they begin to learn English. So is that a, a standard part of the curriculum in the provinces where they live? That's a great question, actually, and I, I left that out. But yeah, uh, so it, it was actually one of the things we found early on that was one of the biggest attractants for the uh, for the families was being able to learn English. Every family went, oh yeah, have, you know, they would jump at the chance for their child to be able to go to a school where they could learn English. Um, so that just became, it, it's not probably high priority for us, but it's such a high priority for the families that it has turned out to be a, a you know, a, a, a big component of it, yeah. And it helps, of course, because then the, the, if they've got sponsors, they can communicate back, with, back and forth with the sponsors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great. Okay. My, my, my second part of that question. So as they progress and they reach the enrichment schools, they have, an ac they have access to computers. They have an opportunity to learn how to use a computer. Do they have a chance to learn any programming, any computer programming? Yeah, you know, we, we've had some, uh, we, we do have some of the uh, kind of rudimentary programming, I guess, that, that they get to learn. 
um, uh, just enough to kind of whet their appetite. Uh, and then when they get into the scholarship program, when they go to the university scholarship program, we have a couple of, so there is a number of universities that they can choose in Cambodia. And a couple of those universities really emphasize, in fact, one of them is almost exclusively just in you know, computer coding and the like. Uh, so if they have a predilection for that, that they kind mm. of gained from the enrichment program, then they get to apply to that, um, that one of those universities. So we've had I'm, a number I'm, of our, of our I'm convinced that, that, that the computer programming for kids in schools is probably the most leveling method of all to make uh, children communities sustainable. And uh, yeah. when I yeah. was in Cambodia, I saw there were special schools that were organized by foreigners to teach people how to do native singing and dancing and handicrafts. And I thought, programming that's what they should all be learning to program from the age of five and then absolutely everybody socks off absolutely absolutely yeah we, we we agree and i think most of them do it's uh, it's a it's a really popular really popular course when they get into the university scholarship area okay if michael if i can ask the third part of my question in the communities uh, the provinces where you're located uh, richard are there are they growing any cash crops that they can sell and yeah. uh, particularly, are they are they growing pepper at all? Are they selling pepper? No, uh, it, pepper is grown in the southern part of the of the country. Um, it, it isn't as uh, uh, I think. There's something about the soil in the areas where we work in the yeah. provinces where we work with the pepper itself, or black pepper in particular, which is right. really a big export. Um, it, it doesn't grow as well. It grows really well in the Kampol province yeah. in, in the southern part of the country. Um, in, in our part of the country, what they're doing is mostly stuff that gets to the local markets uh, for use in Phnom Penh or in Siem Reap. Um, so they're doing uh, everything from you know sweet potatoes to corn to uh, uh, to you know to these long green beans to uh, uh, oh a lot of melons and uh, uh, and squash, uh, but the crops like that that uh, you know that it, it's really easy for them to be able to sell them in the market. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very good. Thank you. And the reason you ask about pepper primarily, Richard, is because Heidi Kuhn in her uh, landmine project is doing uh, peppers in Vietnam, and it is a huge, huge success over there with that, with their prop, with their project. Okay, Tom, you're next. Then Mike. Tom. Thank you, uh, Richard. Outstanding work. I'm particularly interested because in water sanitation and wells, it looks like that you had a lot of experience or specialists that were able to uh, direct you how to do that properly. We have a lot of projects in Africa and I'm wondering how we can learn from your experience. Uh, could you say a little bit how the first wells and uh, water sanitation were started and how you grew from that? Oh, sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and before I forget it, if you, uh... If you can email me at some point at that U.S. office at sustainablecambodia.org, um, I can send you links to uh, a, a lot of documents that we have that are specifically designed to allow other organizations in other countries to kind of emulate some of what we're doing uh, if it works and it, it fits for them in, in the particular region where they're working. So I'd be happy to send those to you. They're very detailed on how all of this works, uh, both the water programs and the, and the community empowerment programs. Um, but yeah, we, we, we learned so much, you know, and, and much of what we learned, of course, we learned from the locals, uh, which is the way that it works, right? You go in and you think, oh, I've got these great ideas. And then you actually get on site and you find that your great ideas aren't great at all. <laughs> and the people that are actually living there know what they need. So um, on, on the well side, uh, I, I would say that, you know, our, our biggest learnings were probably about being sure that the families themselves are the ones that are doing all the project management and planning around where the wells are gonna go and all that kind of stuff. So they're completely committed and part of it because they're gonna to have to support that, that well when it breaks and wells do break. And then the second part was trying to get uh, well components, pump components and the like that are local so that they're not, you know, when something, when, when something breaks, they don't have to order a whole new pump from India, which they can they really can't afford. Uh, so, so those were the things that really made a big difference to us on that. The biosand filter stuff, I've got a lot of documentation on biosand filters and how they're built locally. They're very, very affordable. And they're very local. Uh, but the, the 
uh, underpinnings from that actually came from our Rotary Clubs in Calgary, Canada, who work with an organization called CAUST, C-A-W-S-T, I think. Um, and, and CAUST is the one that worldwide has been developing these biosand filter models. And they're, they're, it's stuff that's built locally. So it does, it's not plastic. It doesn't have filters that are brought in from overseas or anything like that. It's all local materials. So those are probably the biggest elements of, uh, of what we learned in, in doing the water part. Okay, very good. Thank, thank you, Richard. Um, yeah. Mike, Mike Caruso, you're next, Mike. Uh, thank you, Richard. It's a great presentation and uh, great work you're doing. Uh, just uh, two questions. Do you have any partners? I know you have a lot of Rotary Club and district partners. Do you have any partners outside of Rotary that you work with? And the second question is, how did you attract Rotary Clubs from other districts and other countries? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. The, uh, on, the, on the first question, we, we have a few foundations that we work with, but they're 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 relatively small foundations, um, uh, you know, like family foundations and things like that, that are just interested in, in doing support. We've, we've not had any luck ever in getting the big like water.org, you know, that gets, they, they have tons of money that they raise and millions and millions that they raise from, uh, from partnerships in commercial space, but they, do, they just don't give funding to organizations like us. They, they only give funding to organizations that have a lot of infrastructure and, you know, by our nature, we're, we don't have any inter international staff. So um, they're looking to be able to deploy millions at a time, millions of dollars at a time. And, and, and you know, we, they, so they're just not interested in us. We, we've tried, but never had any, any luck with that. Um, the uh, second part of the question on the Rotary Clubs that, uh, that got involved with us, that was really organic. Um, they, the very first group of Rotary Clubs was from Calgary, Canada. They happened to just have a bunch of Rotarians from Calgary, Canada that were traveling through Cambodia. And they went to the Rotary International website to see if there was a Rotary Club in central Cambodia. And sure enough, the Prasad Rotary Club was there. So they just visited on their own. And then they became one of our founding partners. Same thing happened with Western Australia, Perth, Australia. Uh, they just traveling through Australia, visited uh, uh, the, the site because we, there's a Rotary Club there. And, uh, and then from there, it just spread, you know, it spread across Australia from the Western Australians. And then it spread across the United States through you know, actually similar things, the New York Rotarians, I think, and the, the uh, Utah Rotarians all discovered us organically when they were visiting Cambodia. So of course, now we get to go to the Rotary International House of Friendship and we have booths. And sometimes we have four or five booths in a row. <laughs> so. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. G Gabriella, you're next. We'll get to you, Antonina, in a second, but let's get Gabriella. Thank you so much. At first, um, Richard, thank you so much for a really inspiring uh, presentation. My question is uh, when the young people are uh, finishing school, they are trained. What are their perspectives? Have, do they have an opportunity to work in their, in their um, villages, go abroad? What happens to them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think when we first started 20 years ago, that, that uh, uh, as, as an example, I, I think maybe 18 or 17 years ago, our first crop of students, for some reason, they all decided they wanted to be in marketing. And <laughs> And you know, our in initial response was, wait a minute, what are they going to market in Cambodia? Uh, and, and, and so we, we, we started trying to be sure that the types of, of uh, scholarship programs that they could study were in specific areas like you know, engineering, nursing, uh, some sort of healthcare, uh, development, uh, agriculture, you know, areas that would be truly useful. And, and that weren't worked, that turned out to be a good a good move. And over time, of course, we you know we've changed a little bit on you know the different types of programs that we offer uh, them scholarships in. Um, but uh, today, everything has changed a lot in the last twenty years in Cambodia. And now there's quite an opportunity for the students to be able to pursue uh, whatever type of career they they want. Um, and and uh, and I think. You know, having the English skills that they do, having the kind of creative thinking skills that they do coming out of the program and having the, uh, the just the community uh, heart that they do 
it, it, I, I think they become very attractive uh, folks in terms of being hired. And, uh, and, and I think that we have, we have great luck, I think, in virtually all the kids finding something that is a really good fit for them after they graduated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Natalia Lechat, you're next, and then, then uh, Antonina, Natalia. You, you need to unmute Natalia, please. Okay, I got it. Um, do you have an opportunity to cooperate with the Cambodian government in uh, some of your programs? Uh, do you receive support and any help from, um, for example, in building wells, uh, introducing sanitation and uh, schools? Because I was surprised, uh, correct me if I understood it wrong, that you provide school services outside of Cambodian state schools. Why would it be so? Yeah, now, again, really, really good, good questions. The, um, so from the stamp, from everything other than education um, on all the community development projects on the wells and sanitation and that kind of thing, we, we, we don't have any direct uh, support from the government. However, the government, we're required, we're registered with like three of the or four of the different ministries and we're required to, you know, report into them on what we're doing and all that kind of thing. So we're, we're integrated with them, but they don't provide any financial support. Uh, we, we certainly have their, if you will, their, uh, uh, you know, it, it, occasionally they will come out and have, have a camera crew or something and do a, a local Cambodian TV spot that where they kind of take a little credit <laughs> for the success of the program. And that's completely fine because at this point, we just want to have them not you know, interfere. Um, mm -hmm. On the education side, really good, really good question. We have always from the very beginning said that all of our education programs are supplemental to the state school. So if the, if the student is able to get to state school, they go to state school and then they do the two to three hours of supplemental program with us for the mm -hmm. additive education uh, element and and a little bit of that is because if you were if you were a family that was doing better economically in Cambodia you could afford to to basically pay for tutoring classes for two or three hours after school was over where the state teachers would provide tutoring classes and that kind of thing um, okay. so we wanted to kind of provide that for the students that otherwise can't afford to do that in these rural, rural villages. So, um, and, and we think of course that we do a lot more than just the tutoring we, because of all the social elements in the youth clubs and the community service that, you know, these become young, young Rotarians instead of just, just students that are gonna do well on the exam to get into university. Um, so, uh, but yeah, we, we try to maintain a really good relationship with the schools because the schools have gotten better and better and better. And so the last thing we wanted to do was to kind of like have a private school that competed, if you will, with the state school. So uh, that felt really important to be able to continue to support the, the state schools in that way. Did, Thank you very much. The question? Yeah. Yeah. Antonina, yes. are you, Antonina, you're still with us. I don't see you on the screen. Antonina? Maybe she dropped out. Maybe her signal got weak. She's been with us all evening long. Don't know where she yeah, went to. She's, she's not here, Michael. Okay. Yeah, I'm afraid, I'm, afraid, I'm afraid I probably ran over a little bit, Michael. So. <laughs> no, that's all right. Not a problem. That's, no, no problem. No, Antonina is a very active member. That's why I'm surprised that she dropped off. Maybe her signal got weak or something. I don't, I don't know. I have any other questions from the audience? We've had a few people. Yes, uh, Natalia, Natalia uh, Elegantnova. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much, Richard. Most interesting, eye-opening, actually. Uh, now, my question, I have a few questions. Uh, what do you think? How is Cambodia developing in general? And in what direction? What do you think it should develop? Uh, like tourism or only agriculture or, or some other direction in economy? And then uh, can young people go to other Asian countries to get educated? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so in general over, it, it's been an incredible transition when we, uh, when we think back to when we made our first trip to Cambodia till now, 
uh, the, the, the cities, especially Phnom Penh, has just kind of been transformed. It's, it's beginning to look a little like a Singapore or, or a Taipei. Um, I mean, it, 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 it isn't there, but, but it's, it's halfway there. Uh, whereas originally when we first visited, it was like almost like a bombed out shell of a city, just, just horrible poverty everywhere. So there's been a lot of modernization. Of course, there are positives and negatives to that, right? Um, you know, part, part of it is, you know, you, you, you hurt a little bit for some of the lost culture, but I think on balance, it's, it's just an awful lot better of an opportunity for everybody now than it was before. And even in the rural villages where we're working, when we first started working, none of the villages had electricity and few of them had road access. Uh, now, almost all of them have some form of road access and I think almost all of them have electricity. Now that doesn't mean that the families can afford to get much electricity because it's a little expensive. Um, but, uh, but so that's where the government has been putting its funding, if you will, is into roads and electrification um, and not so much into plumbing and, and the like and waterworks, except in the major cities um, or even in the, the smaller cities. In, in the, the provincial capital of, our, of their first province called Prasad is the city. Uh, when we first got there, if you turn on the tap water, I mean, they just pumped the tap water right out of the Prasad River below you and it came out completely brown. You wouldn't even be able to see the bottom of the sink. Um, and now it looks like normal water. I don't think I'd actually drink it, but it's, don't uh, drink it. <laughs> we don't drink it. Okay. We'll drink the biosand filter water. Uh, but they've, they've done a really, they've, they've done a, a good job with those kinds of infrastructure changes. Um, so there's a lot more opportunity for young people now. Um, as far as young people being able to go to surrounding Southeast Asian countries for an education, um, I, I don't see as much of that. Um, there, there's, there's always a, a desire, of course, for them to be able to feel like we've had several of our graduates who wound up not through us, but through some other international organization, getting a scholarship to come to the United States um, and, and study. And they uh, uh, go to university. And, and I think probably more than half of those, and there's only been a handful, uh, did wind up going back to Cambodia when they were done. But the risk when that happens is that they wind up wanting to stay here. And a few of them have wanted to stay here and they become sponsors and they be and thankfully they've all become sponsors now as as have a number of our of our gra graduates after they've gone on they become child sponsors so so that part's good um but yeah I've, I've not seen much of like anybody wanting to go to study in thailand or wanting to go study in uh, in singapore oh no that's not true we have several that have studied in, in singapore all right Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Vic, Victor, Victor, go ahead. Victor, unmute yourself, Vic. This will be the, you'll be the last one, Victor. Um, oh, thank you, Vic. Vic. <laughs> it was very important to learn what happened after my visit in Cambodia 40 years ago. My question will be about engineering education. Do you have any information about that? Yes, we have. Um, engineering has been one of the one of the uh, scholastic pursuits that we that we uh, offer as aggressively as we can to our students. And I'd say that we have uh, so civil engineering, <clears throat> a little electrical engineering, of course, computer engineering. But the civil engineering has been um, has been a pretty good part of. Uh, we've had a number of students that have gone through uh, civil engineering. Our strongest students, uh, and some of our strongest students. My, my wife is reminding me have done the civil engineering uh, route. So we, we felt like that was really important because there's so much infrastructure work going on and so much building and construction going on in the in the capital cities. Um, so yeah, engineering is, uh, I think we might've even had, I think we have somebody with chemical engineering now that's uh, going into chemical engineering. Okay, very good. Thank you. Antonina, you're next. Antonina, you'll be the last one. Last question. I had the computer problems. So uh, okay, I missed ahead. a certain part of um, question and answers. You mentioned world, world uh, sustainable. 
uh, and villages graduated. Does it mean that now, after all work you did in implementing of new model, basically, into villagers' life, and uh, all support and guidance and financial help, if you are walking away from such village, does it uh, completely go sustainable or it's still in the need of Western or other countries for uh, work? No, that's an excellent, excellent question. When, when we first started this, we, we really thought that this would only take maybe three to four years for a village to become sustainable. And my, my wife is laughing because we were wrong. Um, what, what we found was uh, on average, we, we probably spend four years in, in kind of, if you will, complete financial support of the village. Somewhere around the fifth, sixth and seventh year, we, we typically spend maybe three years during which we're, our, our, our staff is going in, they're providing some extra support, but it's more hand-holding and helping them to make decisions. By around the eighth or ninth year, I mean, it takes a long time, we get, they become a graduate village. So we, at this point, I think we have maybe seven or eight villages that are total graduate villages. And when we call them a graduate village, they have now gone for several years, no external support at all. They're completely sustainable on their own. They, they, they continue with the whole village development committee. They continue with their self-help groups. They're financing their own self-help groups and their own village committee. I mean, they literally kind of, you know, put, put money from, you know, into their own coffers in order to then, so it's like a little tiny mayoral um, town, <laughs> the way that they operate. It's very, very sustainable. Yeah. Very good. Very Thank you, Richard. Thank you very much. And, and that's the bottom line is that if you're going to have sustainability, you need to someday in the future walk away. And when you walk yeah. away, hopefully what you have done, what you have built is going to be sustainable and they'll be able to continue on their own. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Everybody, again, let's give Richard a round of applause for his great work and answering questions and staying here with us during this time. I didn't mention to all of you earlier, I should have. Him and his wife uh, happens to be on vacation today, and he took time out of his vacation to come online and talk to us and so forth. So um, he's dedicated to the program and will do anything necessary to try and help it. So that's really, really great. We appreciate that, Richard. Thank you. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test. Now many years ago, 1932, his company was headed down. He knew not what to do. Then Herbert Taylor started on a quest To keep his team from certain doom He wrote the four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rory four-way test Adopted some years later by Rotarians worldwide Some simple rules for dealing with the people by your side A guide for life's decisions, no doubt one of the best Just 24 quite simple words The four-way test Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it fill goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the Rotary four-way test. 
In the class or on the playground With your friends at school You'll find that hurtful words and actions Really aren't too cool So as you make your choices Of what to do or say Remember that old four-way test And you will be okay Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? That's the rotary four-way test. And will it be beneficial? 